Madam President, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I listened with uh, very considerable respect uh, to the speech we have just heard. I hope uh, Gareth Porter will forgive me for saying we would never have expected him uh, to fight for king and country. His fellow citizens took that decision in 1776, and it would be unrealistic to believe they would change it. I am conscious that I am the final speaker. You've heard a great number of speeches, and therefore I will follow the wise precedent of King Henry VIII, who is reputed to have said to each of his six wives, please don't worry, I don't intend to keep you long. <laughs> we are commemorating the uh, debate that took place in 1933. We heard you say, Madam President, that there were serious consequences when this chamber voted that it would not fight for king and country. We were told by Madam President that uh, uh, Winston Churchill said how Hitler saw Britain as a degraded country, how Mussolini thought that the British uh, no longer had any guts in them. But you did not mention, Madam President, the most important and the most serious consequence that followed the vote in this chamber. It was when, some weeks later, Cambridge University threatened to pull out of the boat race as a consequence <laughs> of their disapproval of what had happened. Now, I've actually spoken in this chamber on this very motion 20 years ago and on the 60th anniversary uh, of this when <laughs> I'm looking forward in 20 years' time to speaking on the 100th anniversary. I was Secretary of State for Defence at that time. It's, it's a very difficult when you are actually a minister knowing how to choose your words uh, carefully. Uh, but I'm no longer a minister. I've now retired. You know a minister is retired. It's when he climbs into the back of his car and it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> Quite a difficult challenge. Now, <laughs> during that period, I got to know many generals, and they're very, they come in all shapes and sizes. I was very impressed by them. They're very, very thoughtful people. Uh, some of them can be incredibly arrogant. Monty, General Montgomery, when he arrived in North Africa during the North African campaign, he was addressing his soldiers for the very first time, and he began, it was a sort of church service, and he'd been asked to speak, and he began by saying, uh, God said, and uh, I think rightly. <laughs> My favourite general, and this, this is actually quite true, uh, this is a general uh, who was uh, required to, uh, to take the salute uh, at the parade in uh, Sandhurst, the officer cadets who were passing out, and one of the uh, officer cadets who was passing out was actually his son. And uh, there was a great speculation as to whether he would speak uh, to his son or not. And at the appropriate moment, he stopped, looked at his son and said, think I know your mother. <laughs> <laughs> now, the choice we're being asked to make is whether some wars, all wars, whatever it might be, uh, are, as uh, the second of the motion, uh, and indeed the third speaker for the motion implied, always wrong. That's what they said. They tried to qualify it, but that ultimately was the conclusion they came to. And I have to tell you, even when you're thinking of fighting for queen and country, let's limit it to that for the moment. There have been wars, specifically for this country and for the people who live in this country, that have been justified. Think of the Falklands War, for example. And that was a war where people of our citizenship, fellow citizens, <coughs> have been invaded by a foreign state, by a military junta, had their freedoms removed, and without the need to send the task force, without a military response, they would be living under a foreign control and would have lived that way ever since. We've heard of the Second World War, and it is perhaps significant, you know, in 1939, when it was necessary to recruit from this city, from this university, of the 3,000 graduates or undergraduates who were eligible, no less than 2,600 came forward to volunteer. They knew that this was not just a war uh, for militaristic reasons or to help the arms industry, but to defeat fascism and to preserve freedom. And so I think these are considerations that you'll have to put before you and to recognize that while, of course, there are wars that cannot be justified, it's not queen and country that is the problem. No one is asking you to vote for Tony Blair's war or some other politician's war. As we have sought to demonstrate, Queen and country represent the nation, and it should be war when nations are going as a last resort, having tried every other option, have recognized the need 
to use armed forces as the only way to beat tyranny. I mentioned the Falklands, but of course most wars nowadays are by alliances, by coalitions. And they are just if they have the approval of the Security Council of the United Nations. It is remarkable, you know, there are six speakers in this debate. All six of us were against the Iraq war. I was against it because it was an unjust war. It did not have the approval of the Security Council of the United Nations, and nor was it a necessary conflict. But if I think of the Gulf War to liberate Kuwait, that was a very different situation. A small country, small defenseless country, invaded by Saddam Hussein. The international community came together. The United Nations unanimously voted that if Saddam Hussein would not withdraw from Kuwait, then it was right and proper to use military force to force him to do so. And that indeed is what happened, and the people of Kuwait uh, recovered their liberty. So what we have to do, ladies and gentlemen, is use our nouns. We've got to actually apply not just theoretical or absolutist considerations. We've got to ask ourselves, are there circumstances in which you would accept that a war was a sad but just necessity? Or are you a pacifist, a perfectly respectable status, but one that says there can never be circumstances when it's right to use military force. You know, in the modern world in which we really live today, sadly there are evil people. You must ask yourself, would Galtieri and his military junta ever have withdrawn from the Falklands uh, without being thrown out by the British task force? You have to ask yourself, would Saddam Hussein ever have left Kuwait if he'd only been asked to do so or sanctions had been imposed? <laughs> You must ask yourself whether Hitler would have been encouraged with his aggression or discouraged by the prospect of military resistance to what he sought to do. And would we ever indeed have removed the scourge of Nazism and fascism from Europe unless the democracies were prepared to use military force despite the agonizing experience of the First World War but realizing there was no serious alternative. So I conclude my remarks by saying this is a debate for a mature, serious consideration that we live in an imperfect world. We have not yet reached the human condition where people will be influenced purely by reason, purely by negotiation, purely by appeals to their better instincts. Mahatma Gandhi was once asked, what do you think of Western civilization? He replied he thought it would be a good idea. So we are far from perfection, and it's worth bearing that in mind. Uh, Winston Churchill, when he was 80 years old, well, this is the 80th anniversary uh, of the resolution we're talking about. When Churchill was 80 years old, a young man was sent to take his photograph. And having taken his photograph, he said to Churchill, it's been a tremendous honor and privilege for me to take your photograph on your 80th birthday. I hope I'll have the privilege of taking your photograph on your 90th birthday and on your 100th birthday. And Churchill apparently looked at him and said, don't see why not, you look reasonably healthy to me. <laughs> well, here we are, 80 years after that extraordinary day, when Oxford undergraduates, by a majority, having only relatively recently gone through the horrors of the First World War, determined to try to avoid at all costs other wars, uh, voted that they would not fight for king and country. And yet these same young men, six years later, realizing that the choice was not some militarism, it was not some desire to help the arms industry, it was not some passion to simply meet politicians' perverted interests, but seeing a Europe which was at the heel of Nazism and fascism, and recognizing that despite all these efforts, Chamberlain and his alternative approach had not worked, and had not only not worked, but had encouraged the dictators to further aggression. These same Oxford undergraduates, overwhelmingly, 95% of them came to the conclusion, sadly, this was a just war. You go back to St. Augustine for the concept of just war hundreds of years ago. And just as they came to the right decision, not in 1933, but in 1939, I would suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, that you should come to the same decision this evening. Thank you very much.